21 species were recently delisted from the United States Endangered Species Act. In this video, I am going to break down the news of these extinctions, give a very brief overview of the Endangered Species Act, and I am going to go through every single one of these species, show you a picture, tell you where they were found, when they were last seen, and list out the reasons for their extinction. If you want to find all of the information about any of the species that we talk about today, the links are down in the description. You will have to use the docket numbers from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Put those into regulations.gov where you can find all of the information for why these species were listed, why they were deemed extinct, as well as any other public comments. Just for reference, when I am reading about the species, I will be referencing this document here, which is the uh, actual ruling posted by the Fish and Wildlife Service back in October. There they list out the background, species detectability, survey efforts, time since last detection, analysis, public comments, and conclusions for every single one of these species. Um, this is what I am working with, so uh, you don't have to read all of it, but if you want to, it is freely available. Without any further ado, let's get into it. The Endangered Species Act turned 50 years old this year in 2023. Uh, in 1973, the Endangered Species Act was brought into law where its aim is to protect and recover imperiled species and the ecosystems upon which they depend. It includes not only endangered species, but also threatened species, those that may eventually become endangered. Species are listed according to the scientific evidence available and involves a very thorough assessment of the species status. And again, all of the rulings for why a species was deemed endangered or threatened can be found publicly on places like regulations.gov. Um, these are very, very dense documents, but this just goes to show how much work thought and effort is put in to listing as well as delisting species on the Endangered Species Act. Any species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act has several responsibilities that the federal government as well as everyday citizens need to take into account in order to protect these species. These could be things such as designating critical habitat, which are areas that are vital for the conservation of these species. Prohibiting, limiting, or regulating activities such as the import, export, taking, and commercial activity of these species. And of course, developing recovery plans for these threatened taxa so that they may eventually be taken off of the Endangered Species Act due to full recovery. Of course, that was a very brief rundown of the Endangered Species Act. In this part of the video, I will now be breaking down every single animal that was removed from the ESA due to extinction and giving you a little bit of information about these organisms. At the end, I will also talk about two species which were not removed from the Endangered Species Act, those being the ivory-billed woodpecker and a perennial herb in Hawaii uh, with no common name, and why they were not deemed fully extinct yet. I will try to keep each of these brief. In the description, you can find uh, full timestamps for every single species. Uh, just for reference, all of the images that you'll see on the screen are from an Instagram post of mine, uh, so that's why you may see occasionally other taxa. We first start with the Little Mariana Fruit bat. Uh, on August 27th, 1984, we listed the Little Mariana Fruit Bat as endangered. The most recent five-year status review, completed in 2019, recommended delisting due to extinction, likely resulting from habitat loss, poaching, and predation by the brown tree snake. While the first two specimens of the Little Mariana Fruit Bat were recorded in 1931, uh, in 1920 it was not an uncommon sight to see fruit bats flying over the forest during the daytime in Guam. Just 10 years later, when the first two specimens were described, fruit bats were uncommon on the island. Uh, introduced firearms may have been a contributing factor in their decline because they increased the efficiency of hunting. Next we have Bachman's Warbler, which was originally listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Preservation Act of 1966 as a result of the loss of breeding and wintering habitat. Two five-year reviews were completed for the species in 2007 as well as 2015, both of which recommended that if the species was not detected within the following five years, it would be appropriate to delist due to extinction. This species was thought to be found throughout the American Southeast while it wintered in Cuba. 
In 2000 and 2001, multiple possible sightings of Bachman's Warbler at Congaree National Park, South Carolina. I include hearing a male and seeing a female. In 2002, the National Park Service partnered with the service and the Atlantic Coast Joint Venture to investigate these reports. Researchers searched over 3,900 acres of forest during 166 hours of observation in March and April. However, no warbler sightings or vocalizations were confirmed. Next is the bridled white eye. This species was last observed in 1983, and the 1984 final listing rule for the bridled white eye noted that the species may be the most critically endangered bird under U.S. jurisdiction, citing disease and predation by non native predators, including the brown tree snake, as the likely factors contributing to its rarity. The bridled white eye was reported to be one of the more common Guam bird species between the early 1900s and the 1930s. However, by mid to late 1940s, the species had become restricted to certain areas on Guam. By 1981, the bridled white eye was known only to inhabit a single 395 acre limestone bench known as Pajon Basin in a limestone forest at the Retidian Point. In case you are wondering, I will include more information about the brown tree snake at the end of this video and likely in a much larger video at some point. Next is the Kauai Aki Aloha. Just for reference, I am terrible with pronunciations, so please feel free to correct me in the comments section. Uh, the other, another name is the Hawaiian Honey Creeper, which was listed as endangered in 1967 due to very low population numbers likely caused by habitat loss, avian disease, and predation by rats. The Hawaiian honey creepers are highly susceptible to avian disease such as avian malaria as well as the pox virus. Uh, additionally, small populations such as these are very, very susceptible to degradation and habitat loss. Uh, so this species has last seen in the 1960s and has not been seen since, hence it's now extinct ruling. Next is the Kauai Nukapu'u, which was listed as endangered on March 11, 1967, due to habitat loss and avian disease. The last confirmed observation was in 1899, however there was an unconfirmed observation in 1995. Using 1899 as the last credible sighting of the Kauai Nakapu'u based on independent expert opinion and physical evidence, the estimated date for the species extinction was 1901, with 95% confidence that the species was extinct by 1906. As a note, many of these taxa were added on to the Endangered Species Act very early on, even if their last confirmed sighting was many decades prior. So now many of these are being removed simply because they have not been seen, such as this one, in over a hundred years. Next is the Kauai O'o, which was listed in 1967 due to habitat loss, disease, and invasive mammals. At the time of listing, the population size was estimated at 36 individuals. These birds were also affected by the pox virus as well as avian malaria. As a note, uh, particularly in Hawaii when they say invasive mammals, they largely mean species such as feral cats, dogs, mongoose, uh, rats, really any invasive mammal, but the impacts of species like feral cats, domestic house cats that we have released outside, um, cannot be understated. The large kawaii thrush, or kama'o in the Hawaiian language, was listed in October 13th, 1970. Uh, at the time of listing, population size was estimated at 337 individuals. Threats to the species included effects of low population numbers, habitat loss, avian disease, and predation by introduced mammals. Using 1987 as the last credible sighting based on independent expert opinion and the species observational record, the estimated date for the species extinction was 1991, with 95% confidence the species was extinct by 1999. On October 13, 1970, they listed the Maui Akapa uh, due to low population numbers, threats from habitat loss, avian disease, and predation by introduced mammals. Reasons for decline presumably are similar to threats faced by other endangered forest birds on Maui, including small populations, habitat degradation by feral ungulates, and introduced invasive plants, and predation by introduced mammalian predators including rats, cats, and mongoose. The population of the Maui Akepa was estimated at 230 birds in 1980. However, over 10,000 search hours in Hanawi, uh, 
NAR and nearby areas, including the Kapula Valley from October 1995 through June 1999, failed to confirm the presence of the Maui Akepa. On October 13, 1970, the Maui Nakupu'u was listed underneath the ESA due to habitat loss, avian disease, and predation by introduced mammals. The population of the Maui Nakapu'u was estimated to be 28 birds in 1980. However, the confidence intervals on this estimate were quite large. The effects of small population size likely limited the species' genetic variation and adaptive capacity, thereby increasing the vulnerability of the species to the environmental stressors of habitat degradation and predation by non-native mammals. Next, we have the Molokai creeper, which was last seen in 1963 and was also listed in October 13, 1970, due to habitat loss, avian disease, and predation by introduced mammals. The last confirmed detection of the Molokai creeper was in 1963. Forest bird surveys in 1980, 1988, 1994 through 1996, 2005, and 2010 failed to detect the Molokai creeper. The estimated year of the extinction is 1969, with 1985 as a 95% confidence upper bound. On September 25th, 1975, uh, the Po'o'uli was listed as endangered. Uh, at the time of listing, they considered the Po'o'uli to have very low abundance and likely to be threatened by habitat loss, avian disease, and predation by introduced mammals. In 2002, what was thought to be the only female Po'o'uli of three total birds was captured and released into one of the male's territories. However, she returned to her home range the following day. In 2004, an effort to, was initiated to capture the three remaining Po'o'uli to breed them in captivity. One individual was captured and successfully maintained in captivity for 78 days, but died on November 26, 2004, before a potential mate could be obtained. The remaining two birds were last seen in December 2003 and January 2004. Using 2004 as the last reliable observation record, 2005 is estimated to be the year of extinction, with 2008 as the upper 95% confidence bound on that estimate. On July 14, 1980, the San Marcos Gambusia was listed as endangered. The San Marcos Gambusia was endemic to the San Marcos River in San Marcos, Texas, and historically only found in a section of the upper San Marcos River, approximately from Rio Vista Dam to a point near the USGS gauging station, immediately downstream from Thompson's Island. The species was listed as endangered due to decline in population size, low population numbers, and possibility of lowered water tables, pollution, bottom plowing, uh, which is a farming method that brings subsoil to the top and buries the previous layer, and the cutting of vegetation. Although the population of San Marcos Gambusia was historically small, it also had one of the most restricted ranges of Gambusia species. They have not been found in the wild since 1983, even with intensive searches. Next, we have the Kyoto Mad Tom, which was listed in, on September 25th, 1975, due to pollution and siltation of its habitat and the proposal to construct two impoundments within its range. Impoundments being a term for dams or other structures that are meant to block off water to create things such as reservoirs. The species was first collected in 1943 and first described as a species in 1969. Only 18 individuals of the Kyoto Mad Tom were ever collected. The exact cause of the Mad Tom's decline is unknown, but likely due to modification of its habitat from siltation, suspended industrial effluence, and agricultural runoff. At the time of listing, two dams were proposed for Big Darby Creek, although ultimately they were never constructed. On April 7th, 1987, the flat pig toe was listed. This was formerly known as Marshall's Muscle, listed as endangered, uh, primarily due to habitat alteration from free-flowing riverine systems to an impoundment system, meaning a dam or a reservoir. Surveys in historical habitat over the past three decades have failed to locate the species, and all historical habitat is impounded or modified by channelization and impoundments. No live or freshly dead shells have been observed since the species was listed in 1987. Detection of rare, cryptic, benthic-dwelling animals like freshwater mussels is challenging and can be affected by a variety of factors, including the size of the mussel, the behavior of the mussel, substrate composition, size of the river, flow conditions, surveyor experience, and surveyor methodology and effort. All of these challenges are taken into account when developing survey protocols for any species of freshwater mussel. 
The southern acorn shell was listed on March 17, 1993 as endangered, primarily due to habitat modification, sedimentation, and water quality degradation. No living populations of the southern acorn shell have been located since the 1970s. Habitat modification was the major cause of decline of the southern acorn shell. Other threats include channel improvement, such as clearing and snagging, as well as sand and gravel mining, diversion of flood flows, and water removal for municipal use. These activities impacted mussels by alteration of the river substrate, increasing sedimentation, alteration of water flows, and direct mortality from dredging and snagging. Runoff from fertilizers and pesticides results in algal blooms and excessive growth of other aquatic vegetation, resulting in the death of the mussels due to lack of oxygen. The stirrup shell was listed as endangered on April 7th, 1987, primarily due to habitat alteration from a free-flowing riverine system to an impounded system. Freshwater mussels of the Mobile River Basin, such as the syrup shell, are most often found in clean, fast-flowing water in stable sand, gravel, and cobble-gravel substrates that are free of silt. They are typically found buried in the substrate in runs. This type of habitat has been nearly eliminated in the Tom Bigby River because of the construction of the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway, which created a dredged, straightened navigation channel and a series of impoundments that inundated much of the riverine mussel habitat. The upland comb shell was listed on March 17, 1993, primarily due to habitat modification, sedimentation, and water quality degradation. Because the upland comb shell occurred in similar habitat type and area as the southern acorn shell, it faced similar threats, and you can refer to the discussion of the southern acorn shell above for any more information as to their overarching consideration for extinction. The green blossom pearly mussel was listed on June 14th, 1967, with the single greatest contributing factor to the species' decline was alteration and destruction of stream habitat due to impoundments. They are typically found buried in substrate in shallow riffle and shoal areas. This type of habitat has been nearly eliminated by the impoundment of the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers and their headwater tributary streams. The genus Epioblasma as a whole has suffered extensively because members of the genus are riverine, typically found only in streams that are shallow with sandy gravel substrate and rapid currents. Eight species of Epioblasma were extinct at the time of the recovery plan, primarily due to impoundments, siltation, and pollution. The tubercled blossom pearly mussel was listed on June 14, 1976, with the greatest factor contributing to species decline was the alteration and destruction of stream habitat due to impoundments. The single greatest factor contributing to the decline of the tubercle blossom is the alteration and destruction of stream habitat due to impoundments for flood control, navigation, hydroelectric power production, and recreation. Siltation is another factor, which is where increased silt transportation into waterways is caused by strip mining, coal washing, dredging, farming, logging, and road construction, increasing turbidity and, consequently, reducing the depth of light penetration, creating a blanketing effect on the substrate. On June 14, 1976, the turgid blossom was listed as endangered due to the alteration and destruction of stream habitat due to impoundments. Much like the other pearly mussels we have talked about, siltation and impoundments for flood control are major factors contributing to the decline and ultimate extinction of this species. However, a third factor uh, is various pollutants. An increasing number of streams throughout the tubercle blossoms range received, um, sorry, throughout the turgid blossom pearly mussels range received municipal, agricultural, and industrial waste discharges. On June 14, 1976, the yellow blossom was listed as endangered. At the time of listing, the single greatest factor contributing to the species' decline was the alteration and destruction of stream habitat due to impoundments. The elimination of these species has been attributed to impoundments, barge canals, and other flow alteration structures that have eliminated riffle and shoal areas. Now, two species were not removed from the ESA due to extinction. The first one is Phyllostegia glabra. It is a Hawaiian perennial herb that is not delisted because new surveys identified new potentially suitable habitat for the species. The other species not removed was the ivory-billed woodpecker due to public comments as well as new publications offering potential evidence. I actually have a very long video breakdown already here on my YouTube if you want to go check that out.
I know that was long. I know we went through every species. I tried to list as many of the effects as possible. Just note, uh, all of the links are in the description. I highly recommend you actually go through the regulations and the listing itself to see what the various effects are. Are. Uh, I'm going to take just a moment to speak about some very common threads that we saw throughout all of these species. A common thread we saw for many of the species were invasive animals causing their extinction. One of which, particularly in Guam, was the brown tree snake. Uh, this is a highly invasive snake that is highly effective and has caused the extinction, extirpation, or decline of two bat species, four reptiles, and 17 of Guam's 22 native bird species, including all of its native forest bird species. Um, I've actually done a little bit of research into the brown tree snake before during undergrad. Um, it is absolutely devastating how big the impacts are. Observed bird species declines of greater than or equal to 90% occurred averaging uh, around nine years after the invasion of the snake, meaning that once the snake invaded, the birds were largely extinct or at, low, at numbers so low that they were about to be extinct within nine years. Another major cause, uh, particularly in areas like Hawaii, are the feral cats. This is an indisputable effect. Feral cats are estimated to kill tens of billions of animals in North America every single year and have directly contributed to the decline and extinction of numerous species. Finally, for many of the freshwater species, all of the mussels, the San Marcos Gambusia, um, they were primarily affected by impoundments, dams, reservoir building, dredging, canals, um, as well as siltation from things like strip mining or other factors such as pollution, runoff. Um, again, our waterways are precious resources, and what we do is we destroy these habitats and then we pollute these habitats, causing the direct extinction of numerous species. So um, I hope you, uh, I don't know if you enjoyed is the right word for this, but uh, I hope you find this information valuable. Again, everything is in the description. I hope you read it. I uh, hope you look into it more. And I hope that this video brings awareness towards the effects that are harming our native flora and fauna here in North America, as well as globally. Um, this is not just an American problem. This is a global problem. And many of these effects, many of these problems, you will see all over the world. So uh, if you watch this whole video, thank you. Uh, subscribe, share it, do whatever. Do all those things that YouTubers tell you to do. And uh, thank you. Have a wonderful day.